Just wanted to give you all a heads up that the following episode contains some topics and subjects that might be triggering to some of our audience. Uh, the following is mentioned, rape, violence, and sexual assault towards sex workers. If this is something that you're sensitive to, please stop listening now and go and enjoy some of our other older episodes. And we'll be back later with some new content for you that hopefully you'll enjoy. Thanks, y'all. And as Tyler always says, good Lord willing, the creek don't rise. We'll see y'all next time. I'm looking for something that says, Dad likes leather. Something that says, Leather Daddy? Oh, is there such a thing? Look away, look away, look away, All right, y'all, thank you for turning in to Dixieland and the Proletariat. We're going to talk about Southern working class history and current events with leftist perspective. Make sure to like us on social media at Dixieland and the Proletariat or Dixie Pro. And if you want to give your wages to a bunch of rednecks, then subscribe to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Dixie Pro. We got a lot of cool stuff to give you, including CDs, stickers, a cookbook, Discord server, Twitch stream, and exclusive episodes. We also have a Spotify playlist with some great artists y'all should check out, as well as our merch store. This podcast is brought to you by Contractional Monogamy, Therapy, vaping, living at home, Modelo, pushing people in the swamps, Tommy cheating death, and creative burnout. Shout out to our new Patreon subscribers, Ruth, Colton, Tyler, Elaine, and Sandro. Our monthly Patreon surplus goes to groups that are run by and or help marginalized people directly. As always, I'm Nelson with Leather Daddy69. And I'm just embarrassed. <laughs> I'm Tyler. Tell you what, I'm <laughs> I say, I say, fall on leg on. I right now here. Did you just use the actual words root and tooth? <laughs> Y'all know I'm here. I'm Tyler. Okay. Woo. And our guest this evening is Sophie. I'm Sophie Hirschfeld. So, um, I'm also known on some platforms as Sophie Monsterly. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, Sophie. Mm hmm. So uh, real quick, how's everybody's day going? I've had a really shitty day. I think, I think this is kind of like, I think this is one of those uh, days that's just doom and gloom, this great labor day uh, where uh, people who make a salary get the day off and everyone who makes a, a wage has to go to work, even though it's supposed to be the other way around. But, you know, yay, America. <laughs> yeah. Literally, this holiday forces people who the day was meant the people who protested the day are the people who go to work today. That's mm -hmm. the entire reason for the day. And then uh, I saw where uh, Ben Shapiro said that Labor Day is a communist holiday, but that doesn't mean we can't partake in some capitalism. Uh, and his like <laughs> promo code for like <laughs> this stupid fucking coaster, I don't know, like Yeti type uh, cup thing he has was a commie. And I'm just like, wow, dude, this is fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> I also love how we do it uh, in September where the actual Labor Day is, is, is May 1st, but you know, yeah. we, gotta be, we gotta be different. All we've had here in England is like the last bit of summer. We're having weather in the 80s, which is summer, definitely summer for England, but that's, that's it. I mean, what else is there to talk about? There's still nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so is it raining and really hot today? Is it the last? No, just hot. Summer? Just hot. Just hot. Yeah. <laughs> It poured today. It was hot and rainy and humid and gross. All right, Tommy, it's talk hot. about something other than the weather, please. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> like, on, are Tommy. we really talking about the weather? <laughs> what, like, <laughs> what are you, you, like, you going to talk about? You got to tell us something, Tommy. What happened? Uh, I don't know. Talk about something. What happened in, in, in gaming news? Or something? I don't fucking know. Oh, uh, well, nothing. Nothing that you need to concern yourself with as thank, you thank do you. not play games. <laughs> thank you, Tyler. But, <laughs> we, had, we had a long talk before this recording started about how Nelson does not need to up his internet speed <laughs> because he doesn't do anything with it. <laughs> Whereas Tommy and I are talking about how much we stream and game. And we're like, we're at the limit of our internet yeah. usage. Might and Nelson's you, like, maybe I, I should up mine. For, you know, you what, I, my, I'm Tyler <laughs> and I don't even have internet out here. I've done... Calling this podcast with a rope and a string, <laughs> a rope and a cup. I do talk like that. Huh? <laughs> God damn. For the record, I'm Tyler still is off on a vacation. Where you live, like the old <laughs> yeah. style switchboards with the plugs. Yes, yes, that's how Oper Tyler. Operator, operator. 
<laughs> I do a lot of gaming too. Last night I spent way too much time playing virtual sports with my VR and so my oh, body hurts. So good. And I'm a chronically ill person, so like that that's extra great. Now now look, I hate I hate everything about sports, but I tell you, like virtual sports and like Wii sports are like the best damn games you can play. <laughs> it's amazing. My VR is actually really awesome for doing like for making sports accessible for me. So I can play all kinds of things and make it accessible without hurting the parts of my body that are damaged. So I can play virtual sports. I do Beat Saber. I do. Yes. Um, we play. Um, Last night we were playing a uh, quest in Rec Room, but it's still really physically active because you're actually moving to like use a whip and you have to move around a bunch to dodge things. And so, you know, it's still really physically active, but it doesn't require me to do things that might like hurt my spine or yeah. damage my elbow more or my elbow, my shoulder. I know the parts of bodies. <laughs> I have a degree in health education. You can totally tell right now. Of course. Don't even get me started. On, don't even get me started on shoulder pain. My God. Oh, I've had I've had the most bizarre like weakness in my left shoulder for two months out of nowhere. Like inside my shoulder, I can't crack it. I can't move it. There's nothing oh, I can no. do about it. It's like inside my shoulder. It's just like now we're not gonna do this anymore. I have a really heavily damaged shoulder that um, has mobility issues and I have to you do regular physical therapy on it to maintain what flexibility I have. So I can't do a lot of things I used to do. Um, and there's some issues with my bones that make it to where I have to be really careful what I do. So um, that's not great. This just became a podcast about health issues. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, well, well. Which we could, I could do that sometime, but that wasn't the intention. <laughs> all, of, what, all of us are over 30 now. We're all broken. Say, yeah. This is what happens Literally, when millennials get old. that's a goal old. someday nah, uh, for me to, to, to talk about health issues on a long-term basis, but that wasn't the plan. Uh, oh, 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 okay. Here we go. Easy segue. So what are you here to talk about tonight? I was going to talk about I'm how my I'm here to talk about sex work and deplatforming and adjacent issues so yes. that was that was the goal today all right we got Thank we got you. through the oh. middle age clusterfuck and, at the beginning and i i am an expert on that too so we could we can redirect i think we, um, we could jump in about sex work because if we talk about bodily pains anymore my like my back's already starting to like i can feel it and my shoulders like yeah. you start talking about me <laughs> And my head's like, you have a headache. Go take four ibuprofen. <laughs> <laughs> four ibuprofen. No wonder your stomach is always upset. Like, <laughs> no, my stomach's upset because yeah, you I've, probably I have, shouldn't unload that yeah. much at a time. <laughs> my stomach's upset because I, I, my body's rejected dairy, but my mind hasn't rejected <clears throat> dairy. So, <laughs> I, you know, I know a lot of people who are lactose intolerant that do that. I literally live with one that does that like every day. And it's your choice, but. It's also you know. our choice to be spending 20 minutes at a time, just cramping mm -hmm. in a cold sweat. Yeah. But oh, man, that ice cream is. was good. It's your, um, it's your. You just, you just described. <laughs> <laughs> at the risk at the risk of going on with this bodily function stuff like there will be a moment where i'm like okay i'm gonna eat this cheese filled horrible horrible food and i'll be like oh everything everything seems to be fine i took i took my lactate before it and i should be fine and then like 20 minutes later there's like a second where it just snaps and like i can feel the cold sweat start and the cramps start and i can't move anymore <laughs> I need handles in the sides of my toilet. Just like, ah. Jeez. I have IBS, so it's just random for me. I can't predict sometimes what's going to do it. So oh, gosh. I'm okay with milk. If, if, the only one. If anyone listening like, has subscribed or After Dark, you've heard in detail about, about my geez. gut health. <laughs> I always send people texts when I have to tell them what's going on and I'm always descriptive about it. So it's like, yes, my intestines have now become one of those things from tremors and it's just burrowing its <laughs> way out of my body. And so that is why I'm not going to meet with you on time, but I will be there 
in about a half an hour. <laughs> Kevin Bacon shows up. It's like, we gotta <laughs> kill it. We gotta kill it. <sighs> All right. oh, okay. We could seg we could segue into into sex work. I think we're all I think we've talked about uh, We probably traumatized your listeners and you've just lost like half of them. <laughs> that is nothing compared to what that we've done to our listeners. God. <laughs> I listen to the show, so I mean I've heard things. <laughs> but I'm pretty I'm pretty jaded because before before I went into a different direction i also studied forensics so i mean i've heard a lot of things and studied a lot of things that are pretty horrific so i mean well my eyes welcome, are for some reason. welcome to our show where we also <laughs> talk about horrific things we're, we're now a true crime <laughs> paranormal i have podcast. to read my notes now <laughs> <laughs> all right sophie well, well you can go ahead and kick it off uh where would you like to start and what's i think what's the what's the I what's, guess what's your the background? Most, yeah, what's your background? And okay. we'll start there. Yeah, good. Thanks, Tommy. You're welcome. That's so not how you do it. My interview. background is pretty diverse, actually. Um, I've been all over the adult industry, um, or at least almost all over it. So I've done a lot of different things. I've done. Um, I I actually started with erotic texting with most, which a lot of people don't even know is a thing. Like there used to be, and there still is, but it's not very common anymore. There used to be a service where you could text into someone who would say sexy things to you in return and you would pay per text or sometimes there were uh, subscription services for it. Yeah, Nelson, and, um, Nelson spent like a, like a couple hundred dollars doing that um, back in uh, 08. I remember yeah. that. That's a weird <laughs> no shame. I mean, what, whatever works for you, there's no shame. Yeah. And yeah. whatever gets someone off. <laughs> Well, he borrowed a but, bunch of money from me to to pay his uh, tech sex. All right, all yeah. right, all right. So. It turned to crime and then <laughs> escalations. Yeah, so this is why they're still friends to this day. Tommy's waiting for that payback. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. <laughs> uh, but then I did like phone sex and camming, and and I did modeling, and I. Um, I did a lot of in-person stuff. Domination was probably the most successful thing I did. It's what I did the longest. Um, and technically I'm retired, but I have an occasional client that will call me from years ago. Um, the longest running one has been more than 15 years. So uh, I've been around a long time and had a long career. Um, so I have experience. I worked with um, the Sex Workers Outreach Project and ran the chapter, the Eastern Washington Sex Workers Outreach Project chapter uh, to do uh, activist work and to help serve sex workers primarily in the Spokane, Washington area uh, and that region to access resources and uh, do various other things. I also had a side to that where I assisted people with things they needed because there weren't very many services in the area. Um, this actually involved a lot because uh, the needs for the area were great and oh, the sex workers there were shut out of services a lot. So I did everything from helping people with resumes to uh, because they needed jobs either outside their sex work or they were leaving the sex industry and needed resumes to helping people with access to buses, to helping people with um, with their business needs. You know, um, I put together safety kits to get to sex workers in the streets, um, helping people if they were doing uh, what we call survival sex work, uh, helping people if they um, just needed to understand their rights. Um, for a while, I was giving people um, instructions based on their, I did like little mini support group um, or classes with that I held at the LGBTQ center there, um, helping them to understand not just their rights, but um, ways to stay safe, things that they, strategies to employ with clients and things like that. So there was actually a lot that I did there to um, maintain safety and work with sex workers and um, basically try to help them um, have a voice in the area 
if that makes sense. Um, so, so that's my expertise, I guess. And I also wrote a lot, lot about the sex work, about the sex work, about sex work in the area. Um, uh, let's see, what else do I need to mention? I don't know if I need to mention any more qualifications. <laughs> I, I think no, no, you have no, no. way more than almost anybody else who comes on here. <laughs> Sometimes I forget credentials that I have because I never know what applies to what. And I've also got a ton of certifications and things. So I'll forget what I need to say about something. Well, we, uh, we invited you on here because of the recent OnlyFans situation. And yes. um, you offered to talk about that. So um, what are your thoughts? Go right ahead. Okay, so there's a lot that needs to be talked about about that to kind of build into what happened. Um, so OnlyFans is a, pro- is a platform I'm not super familiar with. I didn't um, use it, but I know what it is. It's basically if like, um, if you took a streaming service and you add in a Patreon, it's kind of what's going on there. Um, and it was a platform originally designed for artists, and um, at least that's what they said on the surface. Uh, but anytime you have a public-facing platform on the internet, no matter what the platform, the adult industry is going to end up there. Any platform, um, in some form, any the the sex industry is anywhere. It's in World of Warcraft. It's in uh, there used to be a, an online community called Second Life. And for a while, what I did, um, I actually got clients from Second Life when I was doing online work. Um, there's, there's sex work on um, internet forums. There's sex work on um, chat rooms. When IRC was a thing, sex workers would go there to get clients. And that's what happened with OnlyFans. And it was... It was a safe platform for sex workers. It is a safe platform for sex workers, or at least a safer one is what I should say. Um, And safety as compared to how easy it is for your clients to do harm to you. And that's what's really important when we're talking about these things, because your proximity to clients is um, what makes sex work one of the factors that makes sex work really dangerous, um, especially in a political environment where sex workers are considered less than other people, especially if you're a sex worker who's a person of color, if you're a sex per- worker who is not the gender that you were assigned at birth, um, those are the people who are the most at risk. So um, if you want to make them safer, you give them a buffer between themselves and other people and there are, there's nuance for people who are in-person sex workers. Uh, and I will get to that in a little bit. So what happened with OnlyFans is something that happens in almost a cycle in online communities over time. It's happened before. Um, it's, um, it happened with, in a sense, it happened with Backpage. Um, what's tending to happen is And I know you'll see, you've probably seen arguments online where you saw people saying, well, this is the fault of the credit card companies. And then you saw people who said, this is the fault of the religious right. And you saw like a conflict online that happened where people were like, it's one or the other. The reality is it's a combination of that. It's a combination of all these social factors that had an influence on OnlyFans. And the, the, thing that um, was really influencing it was these things putting pressure or receiving pressure uh, in combination with what was called soft testa. Um, and I don't know how far back, I don't know how familiar people are with soft testa. Soft testa was a law that was enacted in, it was 2008. Um, I don't, I should have written down the date for Boston Festa to make sure that that was the right year, but I did not think to do that. Um, but Boston and SESTA controls um, online content and forces the sites that, that content is on to um, 
basically be responsible for what's on it. Um, and anytime there's a, a possibility using extremely vague terms that sex trafficking could happen, they can, pressure can be put on that entity to um, face consequences. This also impacts financial institutions. The, in addition to that, you end up with rules policing from credit card companies who don't want crime to happen with their financial institutions. And they will discourage those crimes by putting pressure on companies that host porn or any kind of adult content or content that might seem objectionable. And that's very vague because that means that this also affects things from disability rights advocates, things from when FOSTA FESTA first came out, a whole bunch of people who were queer saw that their content was taken down from certain websites. And it was because of that vague definition of what was objectionable and what was um, not acceptable because suddenly things became considered adult content that was just vaguely defined as adult content. You see things like people on TikTok even now will face consequences on TikTok, not because their content is full of anything that should be harmful. It's not nudity, but it's considered objectionable by the company because it's not defined as falling under something like educational or um, whatever. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the TikTok outline is, but it's specific to their outline. Um, and all of this is because of the FOSTA SESTA rules that are so vague. And it's not actually based on anything that will prevent human trafficking. And that's something that's important for people to remember. When FOSTA SESTA came to be, the people who pushed it forward all firmly believed this was going to solve human trafficking because they were told lies about what factors into human trafficking. Um, most people's beliefs about human trafficking are very false. The action of human trafficking, the mechanisms behind human trafficking, I should say, are hidden by deplatforming. So you're more likely to see human platforming there. Oh my goodness, words. Um, maybe it's best to explain to your audience about the aphasia. <laughs> I do have mild aphasia from medication. So, so my words being confused are not because of lack of information. It's because my medications cause my words to become out of order and sometimes replaced with the wrong words. Basically, when we remove the platforms that people have, it hides the human trafficking elements. It does not make, it does not prevent human trafficking. We are not taking human trafficking away. We are effectively hiding it. Um, and the reason is because the, it removes the access of communication and it removes the ability for us to actually see what's happening. Um, the ability for victims to outreach also becomes um, less available, if that makes sense. So in their effort to not um, fund these different platforms, the credit card companies have a variety of ways that they try to block services. And since they're averse to being uh, um, associated with anything illegal, they're used specific patterns to determine if anyone's doing something illegal. And we're not necessarily privy to all of their rules, which is why it comes across as really random. It's why you'll see only fans go down, but nobody's doing anything about what happens on TikTok. A lot of people are familiar with like bank increases for illegal activity. Um, you know, you'll see that in movies a lot. You'll see like mob movies and we'll be like, well, we're gonna freeze his account. And then he can't leave the country. 
And it's not, that's not exactly what happens every time something happens. Um, and if that does happen to a sex worker, it's actually really harmful, but that's not always what happens. There's not a whole lot that can come from that in the long run. And it's not the most common thing to happen. Uh, they're usually, if you're a sex worker, you're more likely to see your bank account closed automatically and your balance will automatically just be sent to you. Um, and there's a few exceptions to that, but also if that happens, they're going to just like rob you with a bunch of fees. So they'll say that certain fees apply to this action. So you may end up getting only a portion of whatever was in your bank account. Um, interestingly, I have had that happen to me, uh, but it wasn't for my adult industry work. It happened with my seamstressing business that I had alongside my domination business. And I had to actually confront the bank for it. Uh, but it's not a great experience anyway. Uh, but it was kind of funny that it happened to my students for the same business. Um, yeah, I, I actually saw quite recently um, somebody that I follow on YouTube. Uh, they, the bank decided that something was suspicious about his account. And they closed out his account and sent him a check with all of the money that he owned was on this check. This is all of his money. And he was just like, I'm a YouTuber. I don't understand what I could have been doing that would have sent this off. Yep. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, and like I said, they don't really fully disclose to you the rules that, that applied that made it happen. So like when I went in, I was like, well, why did you do this? And they're like, well, we detected something that looked like illegal activity on your account. And I'm like, well, here are all of my financial documents related to this business. Mm -hmm. And um, they that they reopened the account, but um, it was very upsetting because fortunately, my, my other account was with the same bank, which I realized at that time was a bad plan. So I had to move one of my accounts, but um, the uh, they didn't look at that account. <laughs> they only closed the one. So I don't know what the deal was. They close your legitimate income, but left the <laughs> they they close the seamstressing one, but not the domination one. So what? I don't know what the deal was. So financial institutions have a history of just they will ob yeah, obliquely they will. screwing over sex workers. They will uh, they will mess your shit up. Um. So domination work. It, I mean, is that? I mean, is that illegal? I, I honestly don't. I never thought it, it was. It isn't technically illegal, but a lot of, you walk a weird line because even though your work isn't technically illegal as a dominatrix, they will, there has been a history of being discriminated against as a dominatrix and they will claim that you do illegal activity and you can't get arrested. Um, I personally haven't had that happen, but I do know other people who did the same thing as me and have been arrested. So even if you have rules about what you do, even if you don't do anything that's technically illegal, you're, you're still walking a line where they will say, and the rules are very arbitrary. Where I live for the longest time, the police had a habit of arresting people if you had more than three condoms on you. Um, so one of the things that I did when I was making things like safety kits is I created things and I um, that hid condoms and they were disguised as things someone would normally carry with them, but they had hidden pockets for the people that I gave them to and they could carry them and have their extra condoms in them so that they could still be safe because if they were caught with extra condoms, they might get arrested. So, and we, if you're a dominatrix, you put condoms on a lot of things because you don't want your shit to get contaminated. Right. So even if you're not, and even if you're not penetrating someone, you have tools that you want to cover. So you just use a condom on it to keep it safe. There's, yeah, there's a lot of things that can get a dominatrix into, co into trouble, even if she's not, or he or they are not doing something that's specifically illegal. Um, in fact, that's true of a lot of professions. Strippers get arrested, too, for not doing anything wrong. Um, basically, if you're in a part of the adult industry, 
that is face to face, you have an increased risk of getting arrested for something you're not doing. You'll get harassed by police. When I was a stripper, I got um, confronted with the police with a friend of mine because we were just standing outside um, and they just wanted to harass us. So, so that that increases the um, the reason why people would use something like an online platform like OnlyFans, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yep. OnlyFans puts a distance between you and your clients. Um, and there are a lot of people who choose to be involved with clients and they want to just be safe. But if you don't want to be one-on-one with the client, if you want to have that safe distance, OnlyFans gives you a way to be safe, to be distanced. Um, and also, and, and also possibly distanced from law enforcement that would just want to screw yep. with you for whatever oh, yeah. reason. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if you're not in person, there's no way for you to commit those specific types of crime. You right. have a, an automatic alibi. And a lot of people feel safer online because it lowers your risk of disease and, and other things like that as well. So there's lots of different reasons. It's not just, it's not just risk from um, clients being awful. It's risk from, uh, or risk from police. It's risk from other things too, especially right now during the pandemic. Um, I know at least a couple of adult entertainment workers who are doing online right now specifically just because of the pandemic. So, you know, there's that as well. Um, like I said, the, the more marginalization a person has, the higher the odds that this will, the financial abuse will happen to them from banking. People of color are especially at risk of having their accounts messed with by a bank for suspicion of crime. So if your bank already knows that you're a person of color and you're a sex worker, they will already be looking for those patterns. So you're more likely to have um, your bank account tampered with by the bank. So I, I guess... Um maybe we should examine why these kinds of uh, discrimination and laws and deplatforming, this all stems from, I would assume from um, uh, religious influences that, that would make, that would make things like uh, sex work be that, that gets codified into laws and into, into discrimination. Uh, Is that what you've found? Yeah. Well, it ties back into the whole idea that this is a way to prevent sex trafficking. Like something that happened was somewhere along the line, the religious right found out that if they can't directly harm sex workers as easily by just saying sex work is bad, they can pretend sex workers are tied to sex trafficking. And while that, while a lot of people who are sex trafficked are sex workers, it's not the case that sex workers are all sex trafficked. But the laws created against sex trafficking tend to target sex workers. Um, and it's, it's the case that the religious right tends to push that narrative. They tend to push generalized things against sex workers in the name of being against sex trafficking. And that means targeting rules that religious institutions have. That means generalized rules that are going to target us with our bank accounts. It means generalized rules that are going to influence uh, credit card companies. It means generalized rules that are going to attack online platforms like Backpage and OnlyFans and um, content providers of any other kind. Um, this policing happens specifically because it can attack sex workers by claiming that it's about sex trafficking. Um, and it's important to really let people know what the distinction is. Um, sex workers choose their work, and this may seem very obvious, sex tra- trafficked people don't. And it needs to also be, um, people need to be aware that Sex trafficking is not as common as the public is is made to believe, but it is a problem. And this is why you find that a lot of sex workers who are activists are also people who 
want to raise awareness about what sex trafficking actually looks like rather than what sex trafficking is they're told look looks like um you know just because you see a a person um who looks a certain way on webcam doesn't mean that they're sex trafficked and it's really important that uh people talk to people and find out what's going on before you just make assumptions um when i was in spokane there was a raid i have this later in my notes mentioned there was a raid on the spas there and at the same time there was a raid or i say a raid it was an online raid i guess you could say it was an attack on the escort websites the advertising website contained within the city um at the same time and uh the news organizations decided to talk to the local experts and they decided to talk to me well they didn't really want to talk about what I wanted to talk about. They wanted to have like a story with an angle. And when I didn't really go along with their angle, they kind of downplayed what I told them and then played up the narrative of this lady that runs the needle exchange in the area, like the drug needle exchange. Um, And the problem of that for people who aren't aware, it would be like talking to a doctor who has who works specifically on addiction about addiction for people who work in medicine, it wouldn't give you a very good idea of what addiction is like. If you only talk to doctors who deal with doctors with addictions. Um, And that's what the, that's what the whole, what the entire um, population who reads the news in Spokane got as a perspective of what was happening was this one lady who deals with the needle exchange in Spokane um, because of that person. But I ended up talking to her at one point and um, I was trying to resolve some problems and hoping to get a better message out because there were people who were in need and I was desperately trying to get people help when this happened. I was one person trying to help hundreds of people, if not a thousand people or more and um, I tried to talk to her at one point to try to, to get something sorted. And she told me that she could tell the difference by looking at back page, who was being trafficked just by the ad. Um, and what she told me she was looking for were the people whose ads went from place to place. The problem with that is that when ads move from place to place, it's because it's a traveling worker. There are women who specifically just for the enjoyment of the business and in order to increase their um, client base, they travel on purpose. And that's a specific type of escort. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just how they do their business. Most of the time they're independent workers and their autonomy is better than everyone else's. Like, and I was, and I tried to tell her that and she's like, no, I can tell who's traffic because of this. A person who has been kidnapped is extremely unlikely to travel because they are being contained. And this woman was spreading misinformation so bad that she was decreasing the odds of helping the very people who need help. And she was looking at people who need to be left alone. And it was a problem. And it was at that point I realized I was not going to reach my goal of getting additional help and doing what I was trying to do and trying to help all of these other people. And I was just scrambling. So, um, and I wrote a a blog post about it recently about not that specific aspect of what I was doing. I wrote a blog post about uh, getting the DNS list list off of a website that I should not have been on at the time because it had already been turned over to police custody. So when it, when it comes to um, sex trafficking and, and how the misinformation spreads and all that, just as kind of an aside, I was thinking of this granted, I, I might not have been, thinking to be aware of it when I was younger, but it seems like the narrative about sex trafficking has gotten bigger and more publicized as uh, quite recently. And it's gotten to the point where things like TikTok, uh, well, I would say specifically TikTok, where these kind of almost conspiracy theories grow and and propagate so quickly. Like I I saw Mm -hmm. one recently where they were talking about um, 
an online casino that has live dealers, um, cameras on live dealers. And uh, they were saying that the it was mostly um, attractive young women who were the dealers. And they were saying that they thought that these women were being sex trafficked because the dealers would like start to fall asleep at the table or look very groggy. And they said, well, that's all, they're obviously being sex trafficked. Whereas what they didn't consider is that when you're working at these casinos, the, your, your hours are incredibly long and you're not doing a whole lot of work and they end up tired because they can work like 12 hours, 18 hours at a time, because that's how this casino runs. As long as somebody's having a run on that table, they're not going to change out the dealer. So, um, I just, it just occurred to me that like these narratives are just like, they're popping up everywhere because this is the, this is the boogeyman for right now is sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. And even though there is a problem with it, it's just getting, you know, spotted everywhere. And you like to, just to piggyback off what Kai said, you see like viral Facebook posts like every other week. That's like, oh my god, I was in the Walmart parking lot and there was like a, I don't know, like a ribbon tied around someone's door handle, and they, uh, my cousin's brother's uncle, who's a cop, said that this means that you've been marked for sex trafficking, and like people in the comments like freak mm -hmm. out, and it's then oh, someone yeah. come There's in like later and be like, this is complete bullshit. Yeah, there's like the cheese on the car one. The yes, one side yes, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the someone will put, nobody is going to go to that much work to kidnap you. That yeah. it's not, that's not how it works. Um, <laughs> the new thing they're turning on uh, evangelicals on, there's this pastor that had his kid in like red shoes and QAnon is freaking out saying red shoes is a sign. They're, they're playing on people's panic. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is that takes away from the necessary conversation that we need to have about sex trafficking, like what actually happens, mm -hmm. um, where traffic victims actually come from. Um, traffic victims are not typically people like, you know, like us. We're not targeted typically. Um, it's not, you're more, they're more likely to be a vulnerable person. They're more likely to be, someone who is um, alone, you know, if you're a very privileged person, you're statistically less likely to be targeted. Um, if you are a person who is with a bunch of people, you're not likely to be targeted. If you are uh, an immigrant, you're more likely to be targeted. If you are a person of color, if you are in specific types of um, underprivileged neighborhoods, those are the places you're going to see people more likely to be trafficked. You're not going to see the people who are described in a lot of these theories. Um, those people are not the targets. They're, they're not the people who are going to be taken. And the people who are typically taken are taken quietly. You know, there's not a dramatic thing. They're there and they're gone. And the stories that they have are often not listened to because the police don't care. You know, there's um, one of the things that I pay attention to are a lot of the stories that uh, come from the Black and Missing Foundation, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, uh, and the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women. Um, I tried to find one for... Asian women, but I haven't really found one specific to that. They tend to fall under um, immigration ones. And those are the stories you need to be paying attention to. It's not that it's not that privileged white people don't go missing. That does happen. It's just that they're less likely to be the ones that go missing and don't get found. They're less likely to be the target. So I tend to be more likely to to pay attention to the marginalized groups, the quiet, the groups that society silences are the ones that I tend to pay attention to because those are the ones that are so much at risk. Uh, so, so you mentioned, you mentioned a few places um, before now we did, we did talk a little bit about only fans, but um, mm -hmm. are there other online platforms for sex work? I, I, I've seen some things. So once only fans said that they were going to start discontinuing um I guess, adult content. I saw some people saying, oh, there's this other site that could be good and other people saying oh, that mm -hmm. one's not very good. So it, are, are there more platforms or is there somewhere for these 
uh, people who don't want to work with OnlyFans anymore, even though they've walked back, those things can go. Mm-hmm. So there are other lists and I did uh, want to talk about them and um, you can find them online. The, the thing to pay attention to is not every website is the same. And I think it's really important for people to understand that um, when you find those lists, I, and I realize everyone's sharing those, their, their intention is, is pure and good. Like you want it to be helpful to the people who potentially are losing their platform. But imagine if baristas were told that they could no longer work at Starbucks for some reason. And like 80% of Starbucks baristas could no longer work at Starbucks. What would happen to the coffee economy and what would happen to all of those baristas? Because the remaining coffee places are not going to be able to recoup for all of, all of that's happening. They're not going to be able to fix the, the coffee economy. They're not going to be able to hire all of those baristas. They can't take them on. There's just going to be this weird hole that's left behind. And some of those baristas are going to be able to find other work. Some of those baristas are going to be out on the streets because they can't find another job. Some of those baristas are maybe going to get into a better place, but most of them are not. Some of them are going to end up very desperate. And the same thing will happen if they if people lose their platform on OnlyFans, especially since OnlyFans grew so big so quickly during the pandemic. There will just be a void where people have lost their jobs and they will have no place to go. Even if they go to these other places, those places are not going to have the same client base. They're not going to have the same income. They're not going to have what OnlyFans had. There won't be the same guarantees and they, it isn't going to be the same kind of job. So when people see those things, they need to have that awareness that they're not offering the same thing. Um, but if someone does want to leave OnlyFans for one of those things, something they need to be aware of is that not all of those services are the same. Um, things like one of the ones I saw was like Pornhub. Pornhub is actually a hub of recorded videos that um, at least the last time I looked, Pornhub is actually a very old site. It's been around. I was still active when Pornhub was first started. Um, previously, you recorded your stuff, you put it up, and you might be able to um, get ad, or not ad money, you could get subscription money, I think, um, for Pornhub. And uh, I think Xtube was on there, maybe. Uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what the list looked like. Uh, and it was very similar. There's um, some streaming services. Um, those are similar. Some of those sites are buying amateur porn. Some of those sites are buying professional porn. And it's going to be important to know which is which because you can't submit professional porn because that's a different credential than amateur porn. Um, some sites want you to do active live things. Some sites want you to do not active live things. Um, and knowing the difference between each type of video work is going to matter as to whether or not you can use that platform. So it, I know, I don't think the person that compiled the list that I saw actually knew the difference between all of the websites. I think someone just compiled a list of things that they knew that was things that they could consume that someone could potentially work for. Um, so while, uh, and it might be good for if, I don't know if you, do you do show notes? I've never actually looked. I've listened to the show, but I've never looked. <laughs> um, yeah, we totally yeah, uh, If you do show notes, it might be good to refer to that list, but just with the awareness that that list may not be useful to everyone because it's not all the same things and they don't have the same user base as only fans or the same format. 
Yeah, and if you're just a fan out there who, you know, just wants some, you know, second opinions, you can always email us, you know, your videos or pictures and oh. we'll take a good look <laughs> and uh, we'll give you some good constructive <laughs> feedback. So just let and us know. And if I anybody really decides hope. to take up Tommy's offer there, know that I never check the messages. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> please. Nelson no, and Tommy. Look, look, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Fuck you, Tommy, because it's going to come to me, <laughs> right? And I have a girlfriend. And it's not going to end well. So please disregard <laughs> what Tommy just said, unless you want to do it on Twitch, because really that's what think, Tommy controls. Do you really think some crusty and you will have you will us? have you have no idea what the people that send us our fans. Send us. I, I hope that if you send anything to this show, it's prefaced with if you want to see my work, you are going to pay me for my work. Yes. Thank you. Oh well, we we can't do that, but we'll. So we'll like, send some, some send pointers. your send your charge list. Send your charge list and your headshot to, and just lead with that. That's what you should do. That's how you handle that. Nelson's gonna start deleting every message. Be professional, we <laughs> or or not, or not. We take the you know anything, anything you got, just throw it on, bring it on. Be, be professional and just send your professional. So a lot of us have <laughs> portfolios. They could just send in their portfolio and their charge yeah. list. And if I threw and on there some, you go. if I threw on some aviators, I would look like some creepy, like crusty director that like, like would used to like scour <laughs> the malls for talent. So like, I, I just feel most bad. of those people <laughs> are fake. When you see those people who walk around, they're like, I'm a photographer. They're lying. They're just some guy who bought a mediocre camera that looks good. And they're just telling you that they're a photographer so that they can prey upon people who don't know better. Yep. For for anybody, any like especially Zoomers who might not like you've aged into COVID, so you didn't have this time period, or these things might not happen as much anymore because this was like pre really big digital era. But I was one of those people who was in the mall. I was with a friend, and this guy walked up to us, and he's like, "Oh, we're we're collecting people for such and such thing," <laughs> and my friend was like, "Yeah, sure." And he started like, I'm like, this isn't, this isn't going to be good. But he started like walking us, you know, like if you've ever been in like the backside of a mall, there's like these, these long hallways. And then there's like offices in the back, but there's like nothing in the hallways. It's just mm -hmm. empty and concrete. <laughs> and, and then there's like a room in the back and he's like, oh yeah, just come in here. And, and like, there's a couch. Yeah. And there was, there's I'm a just, plant and a couch. I, I'm just thinking like that. Is they want like free pictures or they want you to, they want some sexual thing or and they're just freaks. That, they're we creeps. never actually got we and, never actually got that far because I grabbed her arm I'm like no we're not going in this we're leaving. empty room. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually I'm thinking like a good chunk of our fans are like scratching their heads and like what the fuck's a mall? <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> that's what I mean like a lot of people wouldn't know that because yeah. like <laughs> who goes to malls anymore? <laughs> Um, we, have, so we, we still have malls here. I live in the Pacific Northwest. We have one so, left here, and it's dying. In fact, just less, just yesterday, the air here wasn't uh, clear enough for me to even breathe in my own bedroom. And so, ah. fortunately, today I can breathe. But yesterday, the air was really bad here. Yeah, I was saying that because the the forest fires and everything. It's the yeah. My entire summer, I couldn't sleep in my own bedroom because my air filter is in the living room. So, <laughs> my uh, I do have a question because I see a lot of discourse on uh, online on social media about sex work. Do you do you feel that there's like a disconnect between sex workers that are only online and I guess the I guess the stereotypical makeup of them are like conventionally attractive cisgendered women who really promote like OnlyFans and online stuff and make a lot of money on that. And then the disconnect between them and people who are more in real life, uh, per face to face person to person sex workers who are like, it's not that glamorous. And I'm kind of really only doing this because I'm like coerced or forced to because I, this, I don't I can't do really anything else. And I've, I've also seen a lot of disabled sex workers like really go after um like what the what i said the typically like online like the this like tra traditionally looking what you would expect like a, a cisgendered sex worker woman to look like and like stop glamorizing 
this because I can't do anything else and I have to deal with like really shitty fucking people in order to eat and to, to survive. Like, do you feel that there's a disconnect between a lot of people online, a lot of people who are face to face? I'm going to say you're seeing the different ends of it in person or not. There's a full spectrum in each of those positions. There's the people in person who are on each end. There's the people online who are on each end. But what you see publicly most of the time, if, unless you're actively looking for them, if you're online and you're not actively looking for the other people, then you're mostly going to see the glamour shot version of online sex workers. And that is a problem. Now, sex workers each have different different experiences and the people who don't have the best experience are just as valid as people who enjoy their work. And there are people who advocate for themselves who enjoy their work and ad- people who advocate for themselves who, and don't enjoy their work. There are people for whom the work is glamorous and there are people who, for whom the work is not. And all of those opinions matter a lot. Um, there are people who are survival sex workers and there are people who are pe- people who are in this industry because they enjoy it. Um, and I have been all over this, this each of those spectrums. Um, and it's now I haven't been the able bodied beauty queen because I have never had like the perfect body, but I did fill a very important set of um I felt I I filled some niches that were highly valued. And so I was able to be, be favorites in important areas, I guess you could say to my clients. Um, And so that gave me some privilege on occasion. Um, I am not a typical, I never have been a typical person as far as what you would see in the sex industry but I did get to have some footholds in some places and, and that's what gave me privilege. But I've been all over in those, in those spaces. And so what you end up finding is because of how sex work is um, presented to the public online, a lot of people who who don't get to hear the voices of the underprivileged online, um, their only knowledge about sex work advocacy is the people who make the most money, the people who have the very uh, picturesque, um, the, the widest bodies, the, the um, I'm trying to think of a word for the, the popular beauty standard essentially. Um, And that silences by nature of the internet. It silences the people who have the hardest experiences. Um, As a cam girl, when I was doing webcam work, I was, I was in the middle. I was firmly average. I didn't make a ton of money. I made enough to pay my bills. So I wasn't on the higher privileged end um, I was someone that people liked, but I was, I was plus size. I had, you know, like I had my genre, which was like a gothy look and I could dominate. And that was a thing I could do. Um, but it wasn't my favorite thing to do. It wasn't, I, I was also a dancer. And so I didn't fall into the end of the other people that were on the side I was on. And there is a sense of that person sees the industry differently than I do. They don't see the side of the industry that I did, that I did. And there were people that I worked with who made less than I did, that they had less income, that it, their work looked different than mine. And sometimes people feel trapped even when they're making less. And it's really important for people to realize that that view 
needs to have more space. That while all of these views are a part of the conversation, that the view there from the people who make the least, from the people who are um, not trapped because someone's forcing them, but trapped because this is all they have, um, and they're choosing it anyway, that those people's voices are just impor as important as the person who is making the most. And as for street workers, the, there needs to be more understanding for the general public that there is the people who want to be there and that choose to do that to, for whatever reason. Um, and the people who do it as survival sex work. And survival sex work is something that's complex that not enough people understand. Survival sex work doesn't mean I don't want to be here. And a lot of people really need to understand that. Some people don't want to be there, some people do. And understanding that survival sex work is not, is not just a monolith of people who don't want to be there. Survival sex work is survival. Um, is really important. And that conversation is disconnected as well. And I think a lot of the problem here is that you get people who write about these things who are not in the sex industry. They write about it because they're pop culture writers from whatever uh, news group or whatever. Um, or they are someone who did a more glamorous side of the adult industry and they see their opinion as being um, experty, even though they've only had like the one experience. Survival sex work also includes understanding the demographics that are within it. So you need to look at things like, you're, you see a lot of people in the queer community in there, um, disproportionately more per capita people in the queer community, disproportionately more per capita people of color. Um, and that also factors in. Uh, survival sex work is often a first turn for the vulnerable. People who are disabled resort to it a lot specifically because it's something that they can access that isn't going to hurt them as much as other work. Uh, you see people who are trapped in situations that are, um, they might be victims of violence, they might be victims of um, society in other ways. And again, this doesn't mean that they did not make the choice to be a sex worker. Choice is a different discussion. Choi you know, being there because they want to be there or they don't want to be there is a different discussion than whether or not it's survival sex work. Survival sex work means I'm doing this because I have to in order to feed myself both myself, house myself. And that conversation does need more emphasis. And I think what's happening, I don't think it's that these conversations are disconnected because I know these people that are on that end, that are on the more vulnerable, more harmed end of the adult industry, those people hear the people at the top. So it's not disconnected, it's one direction. They're just not as heard as the more privileged and that's the way it always works. You know, the more privileged almost never hear the people who are at the bottom. You know, it, the, you, we live in a society where the bubbles go down. Does that make sense? Where, you know, the people at the top talk and the bubbles just fall to the bottom and we hear them at the bottom. But we talk and we can never make ours go up to them. So the bubbles fall down. It's, an un it's a backwards thing. I don't yeah, know if that answered your question very well. It, it, no, it kind of reminds me of this thing that happened. Um, I heard about from, from OnlyFans, I think about a year ago. Um, there's a, a quite a popular, uh, I guess you would call her an influencer now, uh, Bella Thorne. I think she was a Disney Channel actress at mm -hmm. one point. She joined OnlyFans 
And um, I think be, just based on the reputation of OnlyFans without like actually saying that she was going to be releasing any kind of nude um, photos or anything. Do you, do you remember the situation? I think I remember something about that. It didn't it happen with a few popular. There's a couple. Oh, yeah. There were a couple that did this. Bella Thorne was the one that I feel like pissed off the most people. She pissed because off the she, most people. Yeah. She, she, she released, she said she was going to release some photos and uh, because of the, the pay, the, the pay system on OnlyFans, you could say that, well, this photo um, you can unlock it for, I think she was charging $200 for this photo. Mm-hmm. And when people unlocked it, there, it wasn't, it, it, there it was, was no nudity regular. or anything. Yeah. It was like yeah. And, and some shit. most of what I heard, there were, there were a couple other instances. There's um, a YouTuber, I, uh, Nikki or Gabby DiMartino. Uh, they have, they're twins. They have a popular YouTube channel. One of mm-hmm. them was going to release something on OnlyFans, And it, it ended up being a video of her when she was like, six years old or something Mm -hmm. um with nothing nothing like outwardly sexual about it she just charged a whole lot of money for it and um Mm -hmm. mostly what i heard after that was that they were harming the other people who were using OnlyFans as actual work by by using the using their influence and using vague language to i guess trick patrons into giving them a whole lot of money and then those patrons were angry when they realized that they weren't getting what they thought that they were getting and ended up asking for their money back from OnlyFans so OnlyFans had to change a whole bunch of pricing rules because of it Mm -hmm. you know I think that's Nelson what Nelson asked kind of reminded me of that is that there's these people who have this huge influence who come with huge audiences who are Mm -hmm. conventionally attractive young cis women who did something, you know, flippantly in, you know, kind of flirting with the sex work world without actually doing anything about it. And their actions ended up disproportionately impacting people who were actually trying to work on the site. Yeah. Just a tremendous amount of privilege just brought it down for everyone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there are people on there that are doing all kinds of grind work. I mean, there's people who are just doing, um, show type things you know they're they're doing art instruction they're doing um you know crafty things they're doing you know things like you might like longer versions of tiktok on there and stuff like that you know so it's not all adult industry stuff Mm -hmm. so you know they would have been impacted by that as well in a way that's you know pretty hard to probably deal with Mm -hmm. Um, ahead, so, no, I was just say, Sophie. Before we before we wrap it up, um, can you talk more about the sex worker outreach project? Um, so you said chapters. Is this like a nationwide thing, or is this? It is. It's international. And, oh wow! Can you tell the us sex more workers about that? outreach project? Is international. Um, they they educate about um, the needs of sex workers, um, and I will point out that sex worker needs vary based on who you are based on where, what country you're in. Um, you know, the, the needs of a sex worker in the United States, as far as things like uh, um, decriminalization are very different than in another country. So like, and I know that sounds weird because decriminalization sounds like it should be the same thing. Um, but what happens with decriminalization is going to be different in a country where you're oppressed based on gender in different ways than it is here. Um, I mean, we're oppressed based on gender, but in some places it's a much more extreme. So decriminalization looks different based on where you are. The same thing goes um, for any other right that sex workers are seeking. So the Sex Workers Outreach Project um, is everywhere. It is um, an organization that seeks to educate. It seeks to, um, um, we do a lot of activist work. Um, We've done, uh, we work on, well, I say we, I'm not a part of, I haven't been a part of the project since 2015. I had to leave it when I uh, had to deal with some personal crises. but 
They um, also do smaller projects to benefit groups in different areas. Uh, one of the things that they did when I was working for it is I joined with the Seattle chapter at one time in order to distribute personal alarms to people where they were working. There were little devices where you could like pull a part out and it would set off an alarm in case you were being attacked or something was happening. Um, we do um, a lot of little projects around it, but primarily it's an educational and um, activist organization. Um, I highly suggest you look it up. I believe the website is fop.org. I will get you the link so that you can put it on your website. Yeah, for sure. We'll definitely drop in the show notes along with any other stuff you want us to drop in there, we could put in there. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else before we wrap this up? Is there anything else you want to you wanna add? Any closing remarks? Um, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I had in my notes that we didn't even get to. Um, I... I can't think of a way to sum up everything because it's so much information. Um, I do encourage people to try to keep educated, follow people who are educated sex workers. Don't rely on the general public to educate you about sex workers because you will end up believing in lies. Inevitably, you will just end up believing in lies. Um, a few experts on the top of, well, one expert that's still actively educating that I know of is Katie Stryker. Um, the most of the other educators I have worked with are retired now. <laughs> um, Sex Workers Outreach Project is a good place to start because it can lead you to a lot of places and finding education about ex -worker, sex workers' rights. Um, it will certainly help you understand a lot more of the issues that you face. Um, if you want to know more about sex workers' rights and things that people face, um, definitely look up things like um, crimes that police commit against sex workers, because a lot of people have trouble understanding things like um, why sex workers don't seek help when they're assaulted. Um, an issue we didn't get to talk about that I was going to touch on is police violence against sex workers, which is really common. Sex workers can't actually turn to police when things happen to them because the police commit violence against sex workers a lot, and it's really common, and there is no recourse. Um, also, uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to name my contacts on here. Um, I'm on TikTok and Patreon as Sophie Monsterly. Yeah, that was the next thing, wherever you want to, whatever you want to plug and where people can Oh, and I'm you. Sophie Hirsch on Twitter. Okay. So. And if you send me those links, we can drop in the show notes as well, direct links. Okay. Hell All yeah. Right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Sophie, for coming on. I've learned a lot, actually. Uh, I'm glad yeah. that, I'm glad you were able to do this. This is great. Yeah, and I have a plenty of content. So, I mean, if you wanted, we could maybe cover it again. We could or, we could do a part two. I'm sure this yeah. is going to be in the news again because obviously. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it'll happen again. It happens in yeah. cycles. So um, it'll happen again. I don't, um, remember the one I remember, Tumblr. That was the big one. Everyone line was like when Tumblr took down adult content and then not OnlyFans, not OnlyFans. Yeah, trying to that was because people. of FOSTA SESTA uh, directly. Um, yeah, that one was not great um it like i said every time something like this happens it it um it makes people homeless it makes people suffer it makes them lose not just their income but you know a lot of aspects of their lives it also something else we didn't mention it in dangers further endangers domestic violence victims you see violence increase against sex workers typically if they um lose their access to income they become more likely to become trapped in dangerous situations. So uh, we didn't get to touch on that either. So. Well, we can definitely um, look at our schedule and see if we can yeah. add another and add another episode to this because there's obviously like this is we started out wanting to do an episode because of the OnlyFans issue, but the OnlyFans issue mm -hmm. is really quite small compared to how much it. It, it's just a, a little, a little, you know, piece of the, the cog that is dealing yeah, with all it, of this. It's a big in-depth thing. It's, it's complex. Yeah. It definitely. Yeah. What Kai said. 
I mean, it's just like, it's like just in this short, like an hour and 15, I've learned more than just listening to people yell at each other on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I think, and that's another thing is that people online get silenced so much. It makes it really hard for people in general to learn about what's going on with sex workers. No, Tommy was very not, excited that you're going to be on. Yeah, Tommy was well, very excited. Well, then I was told um, I couldn't ask questions. So. No, I didn't say you couldn't oh. ask questions. I oh. said, don't, don't be an ass. <laughs> What do you have a question? I'll answer a question. I have lots of questions. Okay, so pricing. Okay, like how does that work? Is that like based on like is that an individual thing or is it, are there like market prices? Like how does that work? Which specific platform are you asking about? Uh, well, I mean, like, I guess um, street work. The people usually determine their own pricing based on the general economy in the area and what they think of their own value. Um, so, and there are lots of depressing aspects to that because there's, because you basically have to self-assess and then try to figure out what's going on with the other people around you. So if you're on the streets, your value could be, there could be a huge range of prices for people on the streets um, and people on the streets, you know, you don't know if anyone is there because they're vulnerable or because they want to be there. Um, typically the people in the streets are the most vulnerable people doing in-person work. They are the most likely to be harmed. They're the most likely people to be there because there is no other way for them to do the work. Um, but they're basically trying to figure out who the person next to them is, what the next person next to them is, is charging. Typically, these people do talk to each other, so they probably do know okay. who that person is. They use each other as a safety. And uh, by knowing that person's price and figuring out what's going on with the other people, they will either coordinate and find out what their price should be, or they will self-assess and determine their price based on that. Well, thank you so much for coming on here. Um, we'll see if we can schedule another episode of this just because there's so much to talk about. Um, we don't even have Tyler here to do a, a closing. What about you, Nelson? Oh, I, I'm, uh, no, I no, got it. Ty, 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 I'm here. Tyler's here. <laughs> Tyler's here. But uh, I'll do that. I'll do the outro. <laughs> you at have to Dixie, do all of the outro. <laughs> at Dixieland, the proletariat, we believe the South will rise again, but this time for the right reasons. Those bring worker owned means of production. Decolonization. Decolon I, the white guy messes up decolonization. Decolonization Typical. and self determination for all oppressed peoples. Make sure to like, follow, and subscribe to us on social media at Dixie Pro or on Twitch at DOT Pro, where you are invited to Uncle Tommy's Twitch cabin. We are coming to you from the birthplace of the civil rights movement, Montgomery, Alabama, as well as the United Kingdom. We also like to recognize a recording on occupied land that rightfully belongs to the Muscogee people and nation. Sophie, thank you again for coming on. We definitely need to schedule a part two because there's a lot more. We could probably be going, we could probably have a three hour long episode, but there's definitely more to more to thank this. You and for it sounds like you have a lot of more notes. Hell yeah, for sure. Uh, Tyler, do you want to, do you want to send us off? Yeah, I might tell you what, uh, good Lord willing, I don't have to kill any more hogs with a hammer. Uh, <laughs> We'll see y'all next time. Woo! Tommy, 